right, I'm going away tomorrow, I'll see you. Jumped on the in the car for, to get the 7.40 home. When I arrived at the station, it was absolutely heaving. So there's some kind of problem. You couldn't move on the con concourse, is it? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I'm feeling a bit tipsy, but I'm also, I'm, I'm on such a high. I've just signed off the biggest job of my life. It's done. I've achieved it. As soon as I jump off that, get up in the morning, I'm going on holiday. Job done. So I'm in a really good mood. And I've seen these two boys and this girl arguing with the customer services girl. But this one lad in particular, he was screaming his head off. So I went over and I was like, come on, just leave her. I said, it's not her fault. I said, look, we're all, we're all delayed. There's no one, just leave her alone. I said, leave. I know you. You with your Botox face um, on that show. Do you know what? I'm the kind of person, if you go at me, I'll go back at you. But that day, I honestly, he could have said what he wanted. Nothing could have made me in a bad mood. I was in just on a high. And he went, who do you think you are with all your wealth? So I leant forward and I tapped him and I went, well, at least I'm going on first class because I'd rather like to say something to him like that. He went, I'll show you. You've just called me a Jewish cunt. I went, what? He said, you've just called me a Jewish cunt. I said, what are you talking about? I had no idea the guy was Jewish, by the way. So he said, I'll show you. Watch this. So we then rings 999. So the next thing I'm now knowing, because I've been in court and been accused before, I just think, I, I, know, the, I know the script, especially when you're on TV. So now I start to panic. So I went to his brother and I was like, will you just let him know I've not said that? And then he went, I've heard you. I was like, what? So then I went to his girlfriend who hadn't, you know, I didn't know it was his girlfriend at the time because she seemed like a bit quieter and a bit more like she would be reasonable. And I said, please, will you please tell him? I haven't said that. Have you heard me say that? And when I really did panic is when she didn't look me in the eye. She looked straight at her feet and said, I heard you as well. And at that point I thought, fuck, I am in trouble here now because I've got three people saying I've said that. And especially in this day and age, anything to do with any kind of racism is a very serious issue. And it's something I'm very against. But for me to be accused of it, if I'm being honest, if, apart from being a paedophile or a rapist, I can't really think of pretty much worse things to be accused of. And <clears throat> so at this point, I started to panic. I was really crying. I'm thinking, oh, my God. So I thought, just get out of the way. If I step away from them, they'll just leave me alone. Just look the other way, you, you know. Anyway, the next thing I know, the police turned up. Uh, at this point, I'm really crying by this point. And I'm saying, but I haven't said it. I, didn't, I don't know he's Jewish. How will I know he's Jewish? Um, anyway, long story short, because I'd rather speak to you about the court case rather than the incident. They then take me to the police station, arrest me, put me in handcuffs. Um, the week before... Handcuffs? Yep. Yeah, but the problem... Well, they took me to the station... Handcuffs on what? Well, that's, this is what they did. So I was crying. They didn't handcuff me at first. This is the problem they got when they got to court because I don't understand the law. They took me to the... There's like a little station on Euston and they took me inside and before all this, he was screaming his head off going, she's a racist, she's a racist. And I remember one of the train platform managers who was actually really nice and thankfully he was there because he was the only independent witness came over and said just say sorry to him I said but I haven't said anything I can't I haven't he said just get on the train and say sorry to him I said but I haven't said anything so they take it when the policeman turned up quite a junior officer they take they took me to there's like a station at Euston a police station they were trying to tell me this young man was trying to tell me to go in this room I'm saying I don't know because it had no windows and claustrophobic so I said am I being arrested because I need to know and he said, am, I, am I being arrested he went go in that room I said no am I being arrested he went do you want arrested and they said boom he put handcuffs on me in the station so then I was really panicking I said please I'm sorry just I was it was awful honestly it was the most traumatic experience they then take took me from there to um, after which I thought they were taking me on, letting me go. After I told them, I explained the full story. I said, please look on the CCTV footage. Have you got any audio? I asked all those things. Um, 
but I promise you I haven't said anything. I have I didn't know he was Jewish. Why would I say that? How would you know he was Jewish? Uh, I told them what was I said, go and go and ask the please go and ask the customer services lady. Anyway, the long and short of it is that I thought they was putting me on a train, but the law says they can't put me on a train because they've arrested me and put handcuffs on me, which apparently you, you can't take them off and once you've arrested someone, there's a law in it anyway. I didn't know at the time, I thought I was going home. When I got to the bottom of the steps, there was three police fans waiting for me. They put me in the back of a police van. Oh, God, it makes me upset. Um, I begged, I was begging. I was like, please, 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 I beg you. Because I have got a real problem with claustrophobia. I did four years before I could go in a lift. Um, I was begging them, please, I'll do anything. Please just put me in the back of a van. Please don't put me in, I'm claustrophobic. And I, anyway, they put me in the back of a van. And it had a piece of glass in it, so the man on the other side could see me. Um, and they drove me to Wimbledon Police Station an hour. And then, so the week before, so I stopped smoking seven years, more than seven years ago. Um, I smoked vapes. Um, but occasionally, once, twice a year, year, I would have a cigarette. But I'm talking one cigarette once, twice a year. Because you can see, I've got my vape. Since this, I've actually started smoking a bit again, which is a bit annoying, really. I need to slap it on the head. But, You'll get that again. Pardon? You'll get that again. Yeah. Um, but, um, so, I have the creme ball, because my daughter nearly died, uh, Aston. God, there's so much I could tell you. I've not told you half my life story. I need, like, about three goals with that's you, to be honest, James. There's no rush. You don't, you don't even know about that. Listen, just take your time. Yeah, so I, my youngest daughter almost died of meningitis. What age? Uh, 16 weeks. She was born with pneumothorax, which is lungs burst. She spent the first four weeks on the life support machine. Then when she was 16 weeks old, she became... Um, she got streptococcus septicemia. The doctor said she had less than, less than 50% chance. If she survived, there was 50% chance of brain damage, deafness and blindness. 85% chance of brain damage, deafness and blindness. As it happened, that day never came, thank God. Oh, good stuff. Um, but um, I decided I need to give back because she's the only child I've met with strep... Me personally met. I'm not saying there isn't other children. And I've met a lot because I've done a lot... I do a lot of charity work. That hasn't got a severe disability of some sort from that kind of meningitis. It's not a contagious type. It's the one that you carry as a mother. When you're carrying a baby so i decided to do a one-off event so i've got a big house I've got a big garden so we put together with what we call the creme the creme de la creme ball it was a one-off event we did on the front lawn of our house it was 450 i never thought we'd sell a ticket we sold 450. long story short 10 years on i'm on my 10th i was then on my 10th year of the creme ball and we hit just over a million pounds we trade for charity when I do the creme ball, loads of people come in the house. People leave cigarettes around the house. They leave bottles. There's, I'm talking like a few hundred people come in the house from the marquee. And at the end of the night, my housekeepers clear up. And if there's anything in the cigarettes, they stick them in the second drawer in my kitchen in the oven glove. So whenever I do have a cigarette, I don't need to buy cigarettes. I always say there's always, because they have the creme ball, there's always or events. I have quite a few events in my house. There's always fags in the second drawer in the kitchen. Sometimes there might be two in it. Sometimes there might be ten in it. Sometimes it might be a full packet. So as I was leaving that morning, I was late for the train. I said to my, my housekeeper, just ch chuck us a packet of fags. She chucked me a packet of fags, put them in the bag. And this is the thing that people don't think, because when you see what the press said about me, it said that I blamed my housekeeper for the next bit I'm going to tell you. She chucked me a packet of cigarettes. It's exactly what I asked her to do. I get to London. Uh, as it happened, I never got a chance to have a cigarette that day. Because I went to meet my agent, and before I knew it, I was back at the station. When I got to the station at Wimbledon, they said, can we check your bag? I was like, yeah, of course you can. They checked my bag. As they opened the bag in the cigarette packet, there was, well, I thought at the time it was cocaine, a packet, a packet of cocaine. When I actually got to court, it was the, it wasn't, it was an empty packet of cocaine that had, I think it was something like three pounds sixties worth. Okay. In so a, an empty bag, a, Yeah, well, a Cheshire empty bag, probably. Yeah, Glasgow's well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now, at the time when I was I was mortified, saying, please, call my housekeeper. You, at this point, nobody knew I was arrested. I hadn't spoke to my husband. I hadn't spoke to my, anybody. I Why the fuck are they searching you? Because they asked, they asked me, could they? And I said, yeah, you can. 
Well, I was arrested then. I was arrested. I'd already been arrested for racial... Racial? What did I get arrested for now? Racial aggravated assault. But that got changed later on. <laughs> they first arrested, arrested me for drunk and disorderly, which I wasn't. I was complete. You know, I'd had a couple of drinks and, and I was slurry because I'd been on the metrodizal. Then well, maybe that's why they've searched you because they, they maybe think you were on on it. No, it wasn't a slurry. Where no, no, it wasn't that. It wasn't that kind of slurry. It was like I I slur when I'm on TV when I've had a drink. My husband knows straight away. I just have a bit of a slur in me because I've got nodules on my larynx, so I slur really easy. Um, but maybe, yeah, maybe. I'm just saying it. I was completely confidentious. I was just very, very upset and panicking. So when I got to the station and this, so I said, please, I I don't smoke. I said, if you call my housekeeper now, ask her, do I buy cigarettes? Ask her, where did those cigarettes come from? Ask her, where did she find those cigarettes? From what events? I give them absolute chronological. I said, can you fingerprint them? Please fingerprint them. Anyway, so I was not going home then. Yeah, because at that time, if you're explaining that, it seems as if you'd explain at that time and you're if somebody's no, trying I've to, got, yeah it's true what you're saying but if the coppers are thinking i've got them for the house it will not make sense they think that you're making all that shit up you know because later on they promised me they would do it and they never did because they even begged them in the morning they kept me in the cell for 18 hours it was the most traumatic i've just told you i'm claustrophobic it was i mean they had to move somebody out of a cell because i'm not claustrophobic they didn't let me open the window so i could get my head out i mean honestly it was i just thought to myself how am I in the cell? I've done, I, I've done nothing wrong, and I'm locked up in a cell. It was honestly, it was the most traumatic thing ever. So I kept pleading with them because I was going on holiday. Obviously, never went on holiday. Thank God, though. The only my saving, my only saving grace is that had had they have not done that, I don't know if it's any. I don't know the law. 100% I was getting an aeroplane the next day with that cigarette packet in my bag because I would have got home and not emptied my bag because I was flying the next morning to Tenerife so I wouldn't have emptied my handbag my handbag would have gone with the suitcase and it could have been that they found it at the airport and that would have been in my opinion I don't know if it is I'm sure it would have, could have been a much bigger deal oh, the papers would have made out you were drug smuggling yeah so I suppose the night in the cell me finding the fact that the cigarette, the cigarette packet had an empty bag of cocaine in it Prevented me from jumping on that plane and being at an airport. But there was fuck all in it anyway. They would have seen many stuff like that at the airport. They'd probably been more lenient than the coppers. Yeah. So, so I then, I did my interview the next day, pleaded with them to. But you thinking in the sales at that time, are you thinking somebody's called you a racist? They found a bit of gear. Are you oh, thinking your life my life's over. My li Do you know what? If I'm being totally honest with you, even at that point, not that the drugs wasn't a serious thing. The racism was the only thing in my mind. It was the one and only, you know, even going to court, I'd have been devastated to be found guilty of the drugs because more because I didn't have any clue. But I would take that all day long to be to prove my innocence against racism. Yeah, a few grams in your pocket. Listen, it's nobody with a bat in an eyelid. As it's, it happens. It's fuck so old. when we get to court, it got, I mean, I had, there was things like, how long did it how long did it go on for before it went to court? Well, so we went into lockdown after that. So I lived with it over my head all through lockdown. Didn't tell anyone in the show. Um When did it break in the press? Well, I'm gonna tell you now. So I, they, while I got arrested, I wasn't charged. So my, you don't I don't need to tell anyone because I've not been charged. I never thought for one minute I was gonna get charged. I asked them to fingerprint the drugs. I asked them to get the CCTV footage. I, pl I pleaded with them to speak to the customer services lady. Just because he said, I'm saying, how on earth could I be charged for calling someone a Jewish con? Sorry, I don't even like saying it now. I'm, I'm scared of even saying it on the, even those words. These are That's what you're charged with saying? Yeah. So it's in public so, domain? So, uh, and there was other things said. There was things said that I said to the girl that she's a disease. I have never, not only have I ever said that to anyone have, have, have you i have never heard anyone calling anyone a disease have you ever heard anyone say yeah, you're know. a disease i've never even means. heard of the saying yeah. but the lies between the three of them there was there was i mean it was terrible but there was big big points that i'm fortunate i own 
I owe my life to a lot. My husband, right? He was, what he, he was incredible. There was, there's a couple of things I really need to get across. I went to court years before with Sunita, which is a boring old thing, the same scenario. Some She said I did something, I didn't do it, and the proof was there, I didn't. Same in Kozak's? Yeah. I'm not even going to waste my time talking about her, like, I wouldn't give her the airtime, but she didn't turn up for the, <clears throat> for the verdict, put it that way. You know, I remember speaking to John Cordwell, because there was when, before it broke in the press, sorry. So... Because of my Sunita case, when I was when I got out of the cell, my mum picked me up from the station. Nobody gets to speak to the barrister. You speak to a solicitor, then they get you a barrister. After my Sunita case, I got quite friendly with Lisa Judge, so we we, we became friends after the after the court. <clears throat> so I rang her and she said, "Come round to my house. Get your mum to bring me straight here." She was amazing, and we sat. A couple of glasses of wine, just the two of us. We sat down, I cried and cried on the shoulder. And then she said, look, this is going to be tough for you. She said, but first thing I advise you, get a private investigator before anything, just to see what these people are about. So I did. Then she said, just in case, I don't think, you know, it's a 50-50. You're not gonna, I, you'd hope not to get charged because there's not enough evidence. It's just his word. But unfortunately, he's got... Free, his, his his yeah. brother. I said, yeah, but he knows them. Of course, he's got them. But he's, Doesn't matter. Yeah, do, yeah. So <clears throat> when he gets to court, we finally find out he said things like, "All police are pigs." All Muslims should be shot at birth. Fuck the Germans. The stuff that we found out on him. And I was absent. I remember I lived and breathed. She took me, Lisa. We did everything for three year and a half. I had to ring her every day because I was. It was on my mind every day. I was thinking, because oh, so at the beginning I'd not been charged, and then I remember coming back from Manchester in a really good mood, and I was speaking to Ashley on the way home and never said anything. And I walked into the lounge and I was like, hey, I was like, you need to sit down. I was like, what? What's the matter? What's the matter? Because at one point, one of the one of the police officers was saying, "There's something not right about these boys. They know you're in business. They've got some kind of vendetta." So we never thought we were going to get charged because even the police officer was like. There's one of the police, a more senior one. So he said, yeah, they've charged you. And I just dropped on the floor. I was like, oh, my God. Because I know what's coming now. I've got a court case. I've got press. It's going to be released in the press. I've got to explain to my children. Um, oh, it was honestly, I cried all night. Um, so then I sort of like after, I didn't tell anybody else other than my close family. Because then we went to lockdown. Even though I've been charged, we hadn't set, they hadn't set a court date. Um, so it hadn't come out in the press. And then it was when I was going to my first court um, Zoom, because it was on Zoom, the first one. So going to court, my barrister said to me, it was magistrates, we can't go to magistrates. She it's going to cost a lot more money, don't she? But we need to go to a Crown Court because you need a jury. You might get one magistrate on the day, you might get three. But if they watch you on the show and they don't like you, they can just take, you won't get a fair trial for something as serious. This is what her advice to me was. So we took it to, and it kept getting adjourned, adjourned. Yeah. So it was, it was like torture for you. For, it went on for two years over my head. So it's supposed to be a three day court case. And oh, when it came out and the press got hold of it, um, I can't tell you, I felt like my life had ended. It was basic, honestly, it was awful. I didn't get out of bed for three days. I lay in bed and I was just like, I've got, I've still got a message on my phone now. There's a message my husband sent me. And it was along the lines and I still read it now. Uh, in fact, I'm going to look at it. So when it broke in the press, this is how bad it was. And I knocked Donald Trump off the top spot in the Daily Mail. I mean, we can laugh about it now, but it was pretty traumatic. And I just thought my life's over and I lay. And, I, I, and as much as I'm a confident person and I've always dealt head on with situations, when I'm really, really down, I hide and sleep. I don't speak to anybody. I go, when I go quiet, it means I'm really, really down. I do the opposite to what people think I would, I go in myself. 
And I've got some really, really good Jewish friends. Um, I've got, uh, and he, he wrote a fabulous, it's David Lewis from London. David and Alexis Lewis are really good. And that was the thing. I was more panicking, not just about my reputation with the public, about the people that are friends of mine. I've got Jewish friends. You know, they wasn't just saying about, it's about Jewish people. It was, I'm a racist. So you, to everybody, you're a racist across the board. It was just all so overwhelming. It was like, and it's everything I've always been against, you know. Um, my son-in-law's a Muslim. I've got lots of Jewish friends. I've got black friends. I've got gay friends. I'm not, I don't judge anybody. I never have done. I've always been a very much people person where, you know, it's about the person. It's not about the religion, you know, when... But we're living in a day and age where everybody's walking in eggshells, but for me, no matter what race you are, no matter what sex you are, no matter what age you are, listen, if you're a cunt, you're a cunt. It's yeah, as simple yeah. as that, and that's yeah. life. And, and that's exactly what... I don't give a fuck who you are. If you're going to be a dick, I'm going to tell you you're a dick. It's nothing yeah. to do with your fucking... But I actually, that, that that day, the annoying thing is, that day, can I be honest with you? Yeah. Like, if I say the word cunt, I always say it to my friends laughing. I don't call, if I'm mad, it's not a word I ever use, you're a cunt. I'd say, you're a dick, you're a bitch, you're a, it's not a word I use when I'm, when I'm angry. I, I love the word, by the way, the word cunt. Let me just get that out there. Yeah, so does it, Scottish. Cunt and twat, love I love you, it. Love you, you cunt. But I would say it as in, hey, you cheeky little cunt, you cheeky yeah. little twat. You know, joking with my friends. It's the meaning right? behind that. Yeah, I would say, I'd say another word if I was mad. That day, I wasn't even angry. He couldn't get me angry. I was going on holiday. I'd just signed up the biggest job in my life. So anyway, it comes out in the press. It's honestly everywhere. And I just couldn't get out of bed. And nobody forced me to get out of bed. My kids were trying to console me. Um, were you suicidal? Eh? Were you suicidal? No. No, I, I wasn't at my worst at this point. The worst was after the court case. And I've got a message off Ashley and it just said, I've got some really good friends. I said, I'll, you know, Alexis and David Lewis, who were Jewish, who were very, very, very good friends of ours. It was more explaining. Now it's in the press. This is what my husband's trying to tell me. So he said, hey, Dan, I've left you in bed to rest. I've gone to the gym, then the architects in Manchester. Call me when you're up and feel better. The worst has gone. God, it makes me upset. And it's already history. Although it appears shattering to us lot to most of the world and people with their own problems it's nothing more than a one minute read that's now history i really don't think we could ignore speaking to key people in our life and friends i would make a list today even just a little text message but just to call people starting with my dad oh, fucking hell. john cordwell dave and alexis and then with my eyes are watering through and then we can start to repair everything. You have so many good friends and a family that adores and loves you. So rest assured, we will come through this stronger than ever. I love you. No rush to you to get out of bed. So I literally just thought, for everything I've talked about today, my interviews about my parents bringing me up and about being strong, I thought, I, this isn't just about me, this accusation. This affects my whole family. So me lying in bed's not going to help them. I've got to get up. And I've got to go and beat him. And I've got to go and prove me innocent. So then I, I was dreading ringing my friends, dreading ringing. And you know, every single one of them said, he said, stop right there. I remember David Lewis saying to me, stop right there. I don't want to hear any more. You don't ever have to explain to me. You're one of the least racist, but you know, John Cardwell was amazing. Ashley's dad was incredible. Um... We never told his dad, because his dad's in his 90s and we didn't want to worry him. I mean, my parents knew right from the beginning. Because we didn't want to tell his dad unless he really needed to know. It was so, he was so... He actually wanted to come to court. Um, um, so we get to the courts. Um, oh, so with Housewives, I sort of decided then, you because know, this is, goes back to the question, why did you leave the show? That man would have probably never known who I was had he not been on television. Um, I do think with the, if I'm being totally honest with you, I think with the police system, jury CPS, when you're somebody that's a public figure, 
I don't think you get treated fairly at all. I think if it was Joe Bloggs on the street and the police officer said, they said this and they found, I know people that told me they've had loads of bags of coke found and they've took it off them and sent them home. I'm not saying that that's right. I'm explaining when you're in the public eye, I think then they're too frightened of making a decision at CPS. They'd rather send you to court and let the jury decide or the judge decide because they don't want to be the one seen letting off somebody on the television. I, I do truly believe that. Because um, my court case, throwing a napkin at Sinisa should is a waste of public money. And we went to court because I threw a napkin at her. I mean, that's that's what we're dealing with. So I've then got to grab every bit of evidence. We go to court. My barrister, Lisa, has held my hand for two years emotionally. She's one of my closest friends now. I, uh, I She's incredible. I was petrified. It should have been a three-day court case. We're in court nine days. He got up. Um, he told some big whopping lies, like really big whopping lies. First of all, he told the police officer who was a special constable. Because obviously he wants me arrested. He started off with his 999 call that you've got the footage and you've got the 999 call and you can, they're all synced. And he's saying, quick, you can see me stood there and I'm saying, but I haven't done anything. My whole body language is quiet. I'm, I'm clearly crying. He's going, don't come near me. You need to come now. She's, she's getting really agitated. She's getting really, and you can, I'm not budging. Uh, and she keeps referring to Hitler. So, but then when the police come, he forgot to tell them. So what my barrister said to him is, if she said, so what my barrister did was turn off the sound so he didn't know what he said. He didn't, because he, he'd forgot what he said on the 99 call, nine call. And then it shows you where I say, I just did that. And he goes, there's the strike. That wasn't even the, that was after when he rang the 99. He just lied through his teeth on lots of things. He said it affected him mentally. He, he, um, couldn't go on to public transport anymore. Um, the press attention he got, but he forgot he shared his, he shared the press on his social media several times, which we had proof he'd done. So he deleted it before we went to court, but we already had it. So it's, I mean, it was a really long winded thing. The girl told lots of lies. The only independent witness came, um, oh, the drug expert came on, um, the fingerprints came back. There was three fingerprints on them, not mine. Not even on the cigarette packet with my fingerprints. Um, I remember, I think they said at the station I could have wore gloves, but it's a bit bizarre. <laughs> anyway, there was three sets of fingerprints on both. So um, the moral of the story is it got to the last day and I can honestly say every night after court, I've been with Ashley 30 years, I think I told you this earlier on. I saw him cry when his granddad died. The second time in 30 years I saw him cry was when he danced with his mother at our wedding. I saw my husband cry that week five times because he was in that much pain trying to protect me. He lived and breathed every part of the case. He stayed up till five in the morning listening to the audio, seeing if there was any evidence. And he was the one that found that uh, Jake Jacobs had actually come off the stand so we couldn't re-question him when we found that he said he was a special and lied about it. We had to question his brother about it. Ashley found that at four o'clock in the morning. Nobody picked up on it because he'd lived and breathed because he wanted to save me because he knew I was, I was telling the truth um, between him and Lisa. And one night before court, I got up for court and I actually wet the bed. In, 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 I've never wet the bed in my life. I wet the bed. Because uh, the... the um, I was looking every day at the jury thinking, oh, that one doesn't like me. There's just the whole, the, the stress. It's not an environment I'm used to. I could have gone to jail. You know, my, I had so many things running through my mind. And yeah, we had a great case. When We knew he told lies. We've got proof he tells lies. We've got proof he's a racist. We've got, but ultimately, 12 people have got to believe you. So my barrister all the way through just said, you can never say, we've got a great case, Dawn. He's, you know, he's, but nobody knows what that jury is. So it's very, very, very stressful. So we get to the final day and my barrister's speech, 
his final speech was amazing. She was amazing, sorry. She she went on to say... Why did you choose a woman? I chose Lisa George, not about being a woman. She represented me in this Anita case. That's how I met her. So you just you know she had your back from day one? She is, honestly, as a criminal barrister, if I was a billionaire, because people say it's about money. It wasn't about money. I didn't win. I won because the ju- because what we proved that our case was everything we said was the truth and justice and each and so I'll get to the jury in a sec so it was all there the evidence the police hadn't even investigated it hadn't even spoken to the one witness that witnessed everything was the customer service they haven't even they hadn't even interviewed her they had no statement from her the only statement we had from an independent police sorry independent witness was the train manager who was the one that told me to get on the train. And he got on the stand and he said, he said, and when I came here, she was very clearly upset. He was very aggressive. He was shouting, she's a racist. I told him to calm down. He was swearing and shouting. My barrister said, what was she doing? He said, she was clearly upset. He said, how would you describe her? He said, she was actually very nice. And he said, she grabbed my hand and said, please help me. And my barrister said to him, this was an Asian man, um, I forgot his name now, off the, a train manager. And he said, she said to the, um, the gentleman, is there anything on him that would, you could see he was Jewish? And he didn't, not only did he not say no, he said absolutely not, because he didn't wear a, uh, what they call? Oh, but the hat's called I don't know. Yeah, anyway, he didn't, he Little didn't have, thing. Yeah, he wasn't an Orthodox Jew, Jewish man. He was, it was, there were two young lads. In fact, if anything, I think he looked more Italian. I've got friends that look, a, got a little bit of a Jewish look, you know, for the Jewish community. But I promise you, I, I had no idea he was Jewish. Neither did the, the independent witness, neither did the policeman. The policeman was interviewed, having, then when he saw all the evidence, because they never, he was very junior. The officer that arrested him was extremely junior. And in actual facts, he'd been off with, with nerves, I think. I felt really sorry for him. When he actually was up on the stand and he looked at all the evidence, she actually said, knowing now, and you've seen all the evidence, that do you think it's been investigated correctly? Knowing what you know now today, would you want this lady being found guilty? And he said no. And he actually smiled. I felt sorry for him, he smiled. Even though he arrested me, even though he put me in the back of the van, that's how soft I am. I actually felt really sorry for the, for the officer. And then it came to the final speech and, and my barrister was, it was the most emotional, traumatic thing, that final speech. I was, I was, I mean, I cried a lot in court. When I saw the footage on the body cam of me pleading with him, please don't put me in the back of a van. It was really difficult for me to watch. My husband was crying, I was crying, it was really bad. And every day you're like, when you're in court, you're thinking, I'll put my crisp there because that's a good luck. We've got to do this. And we ended up going a bit doolally with it because I was so panicking about I was going to get found guilty. And she got to the final speech and she said, she said, I, I love going on holiday. She said, I got to Euston Station. I can recite it word for word because this last speech was sticking in my mind for the rest of my life. <clears throat> so she said, my husband cut me up. In fact, my husband still today can't, she, he actually can't get the final, you know, they do the final speech. Mm-hmm. He said, I'm going on holiday and um, I was at Euston Station and I seen this family, they had like suitcases. She thought, oh, I wish, this is her speaking to the jury. She said, I thought, I wish I was going on holiday. She went, but unfortunately I've got to come here. She said, how many of you when you go on holiday, you go in WH Smith and you think I'll buy a good book and you go at the, to the top of the thing and you grab the book and it says, and you, and you buy it because of what it says in the front of the cover. Rich like a rated assault, possession of a class A. I was actually, I had three counts because I had racially aggravated assault against Jake Jacobs, but I had the same against his brother because his brother heard it. So I had two counts with that and then the drugs, possession of a class A. So she said, here's the front cover of the book. Racial aggravated assault, possession of a class A. She said, I'll leave that thought with you. Then, because I'm, my, my, my husband's at the back thinking, why should, why should going on about books? Why should I tell it, reminding him about all the evidence? So she then went into all the evidence. 
for an hour. She then came back. She said, I want to bring you back to that book. She said, do you know what's special about this book? Oh, hang on. She said, how many of you have bought a book and when you read the end, it was nothing like what it said on the cover? She said, but you know the difference to this book? This book's got 12 authors. She said, that girl there, how many of you, she said, have gone, I've got it all wrong. How many of you have got a bedtime story by your mum and dad, your auntie, your uncle, your brother, your sister? And when you get to the end of the story, they said, and lived happily ever after. She said, this lady can never live happily ever after because unfortunately, the damage is already done. She said, but you know what's special about this book? She said, it's got 12 authors and you can simply write the end. And then she sat down. It was so un unbelievable. The jury went out. This is the best I've ever done. This is the least I've ever cried telling this story. I'm quite proud of myself. The jury went out. And it was painful to watch my husband pace. When I say pace, count door panels. It was awful. It was Honestly, it was awful. So it was getting towards the end of the day. And when you're in court, I don't, you'll know this. The bad thing about being in court is the first part is all about what you've been accused of. So the press, you see all the negative things. The jury look at you funny. The judge looks at you funny. Everyone thinks, oh my God, have you done this? It's a horrible feeling. It's only when you get halfway through the case and we can start to prove the other side. But for the first three days, but the press don't report all the good things that have been said. What about what? He's lied about this. What about? Because it doesn't sell newspapers. And that is what's traumatic and so damaging. Because even now, when I go on Google, we're trying to get it taken down. It's I've been racist to a... I, um, what's, the, what's the place called? In, I, where the Holocaust... Um, oh, Auschwitz, oh, I can never say yeah. it. Grand because obviously his, her grandfather was part of that, which is terrible, but I've called her a disease. And they're the headlines. I, one, I've not called her a disease. Number two, I don't know you're Jewish. Number three, I've, I've never met your granddad. I don't know any of it. So I, how dare you put a big headline? It's, I mean, it's shocking. So they went out and the jury came back and there was this one member of jury that was in the middle that all week you cling on to hope and you look at a jury member and you think, I think he might have had a little smile at me or... You cling on to everything. But there was this one girl that I thought she really doesn't like me. Lisa said, we used to talk about the jury every night saying, do you think they do? And I think the man on the left might like me now. And it's horrible, horrible, horrible. And um, and so the verdict, so it was about to come to the end of the day and she asked the judge, even if they haven't reached the decision on all three counts, can we see if they've at least reached a decision on counts one and two? And he agreed to it. And they came in. And they said they'd reached decisions on count one and two. So it was the racism. My heart 